And we are recording. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. It's me, Elijah Avalon, and welcome back to the channel. This is the start of a new series called Mystic Meetups. And I'm so happy you're here watching it because I have a very, very special guest today. Someone that I really, really, really look up to and really adore in our community as magicians, which is as a whole. And that is Jasmine Ambrosia. Jasmine, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I was delighted when you requested that I be part of this. So of course. I'm excited um, for this. And I'm excited to see like how this grows and like the other people that get involved. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I hope it just continues to grow and grow and grow and that I can get very different and interesting voices showcased here on the channel. Because I think that's <laughs> what's important, you know? Like, we're not all the same. Like you have right. on your channel, we're not, we don't all think the same. And I don't think that a lot of those voices that aren't the same get a lot of uh, space to speak on how they are different. And so I want to talk about that, you know? Yeah. So periodically I am going to be drinking from a Blue Mason jar, um, a special concoction because I have allergies. <laughs> well, I will be drinking from a not Starbucks, but Starbucks <laughs> knockoff. Uh, tumbler that one of my coven daughters got me for my birthday. Um, <laughs> That's nice. And it's also a special concoction um, as well. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to jump right in with the big okay. questions first. Okay. All right. So first question being, you know, Jasmine, why witchcraft? Why witchcraft? Why witchcraft? Well, Okay, so I think that for me, this the first thing that I think of is it kind of takes it back to as a witch born or made, that like mm -hmm. hot topic there, right? Yeah. Um, and for me, um, I feel like it's both, which is our born and made. So for me, witch is who I am. Like it's an integral part of like my identity. So I just am witch. Now, I also, in this incarnation, like many other witches, chose to follow this path in this incarnation. Mm -hmm. But I believe that why witchcraft? Like, why did I choose to walk down this path in this lifetime? Um, because to me, witchcraft is like, it's the art of the wise. It's empowerment. It's wisdom. And it's how I connect to the divine externally and internally. Um, something else that I think maybe some of the viewers of this series might find controversial is that witchcraft for me, while it is a practice, like I practice folk magic, it's also like my religion. Mm, okay. See, I have questions about that actually a little later. So I'm glad you brought that up. Like this is my religion. Um, yeah. So why witchcraft? Like to me, that's almost like asking to like, why are you Jewish? Like yeah. people are born Jewish and also two people choose to practice like Judaism. And so it's a similar question as how I interpret that. Okay. Was there ever a time in your life when you thought that maybe you would pursue some other type of religion in your life? So I think I've talked a little bit on my own channel and some other people's channel about my religious upbringing, which... Mm -hmm like my dad's side of my family is like fairly secular. Um, and then my mom's side of my family kind of has almost more like what I would, what we would call like Sufism or like sort of spiritual yeah. Islamic sort of like background. And so I grew up like with a lot of that, um, like the first sort of like pagan gods um, that I was really introduced to was two ways. One through public school, like the Greek gods. And like, I think, fifth or sixth grade we had to learn about them in public school um but also like growing up like my grandmother having been in egypt for a while has a lot of um comedic pantheon like papyris in her living room and like canopy jars over her fireplace you can talk to crafton about this too she's been at my grandmother's house uh shout out to grams um because she does watch some of my content sometimes so you oh. might have my grandmother watching this video um but yeah like isis or hoppy or so back like i kind of learned about them as a child but more so like in a 
mythology literary sense. Right. Um, because it was very much like God, Allah, the higher power. Right. And like these were stories as opposed to like these were valid gods. Um, so yeah, background wise, that's kind of where I've come from. And then like for a lot of my teenage years, I was a pretty like staunch atheist. Like I was one of those atheists who would argue <laughs> with anybody willing to yeah. argue with me about how I was right and how I had the answers. Um, and there is some atheism still in my practice too. And like, you know, you can be a witch and still be atheistic and still have that. So um, I went from being an atheist to then like kind of being a Wiccan. Um, I was never initiated in like Gardnerianism or Alexandrianism. I would mm -hmm. be what I would call like an eclectic Wiccan. And I kind of just like cherry picked things I liked from like different pagan backgrounds and then like blended it with this organized sense of Wicca that I found in like new age books. Cause I worked at a new age store in my early twenties. Um, and then that worked up until it didn't for me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, so I don't know if Wicca really vibes with me. Like the more I actually practiced it, the more I was like, uh, I don't know if this is for me. I'm not like shitting on Wicca or, or anything. Cause I think that like, you know, Doreen Valiente, Gerald Gardner, you know, I think that some of these people heavily influence the Western occult world for better and worse. So I don't want to like make it sound like I have an issue necessarily with Wicca. That just wasn't my truth. Mm -hmm. um, so then I was just kind of like standing and like witch, which kind of like led me to some traditional witchcraft, um, ATW sort of vibes. Um, but then I kind of like went down a Thelemite sort of path and was like into like Aleister Crowley's Thelema. And I dabbled in that for a little while. And then I was like, don't really want to deal with these neckbeard dude bro Thelemites yeah. who are constantly <laughs> looking for their scarlet woman. Um, still love Babylon, still love the queerness of Thelema, like with the sacred whore and had the kind of like coming together, had the Inuit coming together to make the Babylon child this mm -hmm. hermaphroditical deity, which I hadn't really experienced in other paths. Like in Wicca, it was very male, female, that's it. And like their gods are very interwoven. Like the goddess exists to constantly birth and breed with the god, basically. Um, and that wasn't the vibe for me. And so right. Thelema kind of introduced me to this idea of like hermaphrodism within the divine, which then kind of brought me back to American folkloric witchcraft. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I forget what your right. original question was. I'm sorry. <laughs> you definitely answered it. Um, so it does seem like you, I hate to use the word destined, but you kind of were always kind of on the road to this path. It seems like your whole life, everything. Led oh, right. In terms always. of, in terms of how, why witchcraft. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, even growing up, like my, like my grandmother, for example, or mm -hmm. my mother, and I bring them up because I'm closer with my mother's side of the family. Um, there's kind of a big question mark when it comes to my biological father. Um, my dad who like adopted me, that's like a separate thing. There's like my father and my dad. For those who know, y'all know. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm close with my mom's side of the family and they would not call themselves witches necessarily. Though I have gotten my grams to like kind of get more comfortable with the title of witch. Um, but she still very much like loves that for me. You know what I mean? Right. But she's more comfortable with it. Um, but yeah, growing up like divination, like reading Memluk or playing cards was like dinner table activities or when someone would get married, like doing astrology and doing like um, casting a chart basically for the wedding dates and like looking at planetary factors, uh, pros and cons of different times of year to have the wedding was just like normal. Like, and they wouldn't call that witchcraft, but like right. it's astrology, which to me is kind of like, it's an art of the craft, I feel like. It's kind of adjacent to, inside with, like, come on, yeah. Yeah, totally. So before I ask the next question, 
I just want to say I have a uh, quite a few followers of Aleister Crowley who follow this channel pretty regularly. So I just want to say that anything that is said about Thelema and Aleister Crowley is our both of it's our opinions. It's not we're not saying that that's the ultimate absolute truth. It's our opinions. And yeah. our opinions on those who follow, because those are our experiences that we've had with Thelemites. Anyway, with that said. Um, but also brought... don't be a neckbeard dude, bro. Like, don't do that. Right. Don't make women in your spaces feel uncomfortable because you're making them feel like an object and a vessel for the divine. Like, don't be a scarlet neckbeard dude, bro, period. And that's what I have to say to those Thelemite followers. Like, if you're going to act like that, stop. Like, you're pushing women out of your spaces by acting like that. And it's predatory behavior. Yes. Sorry. Well, you heard it here, guys. Because I know that the you Thelemites who do follow me, and I appreciate you, you are all male. And to my knowledge, you are all cis straight males. So you heard it here first. <laughs> Um, so you had mentioned Wicca and how you mm -hmm. kind of have like an ebb and flow with Wicca. And I think that's something that all of us, regardless of where we sit now on the magical path, we have all interacted with Wicca somehow, some way at some point, because right. it's, it's unavoidable. Um, right. so that brings me to the question, is Wicca inseparable from witchcraft at this point in time? Is it inseparable? I don't think so. Um, I think that witchcraft is a broad term that can relate to like a lot of things. Like you have a lot of folk practices that can fall underneath like witchcraft. Um, example being, you know, look at the Strega path, look at uh, the Gospel of Aradia. That's a very traditional Italian uh, folk practice that really, in my opinion, doesn't have much to do with Wicca. Um, you have other cultural practices as well that weave the Abrahamic religions into folk magic um, that really have nothing to do with Wicca. And honestly, in my opinion, a lot of what Gardner got, he got from Crowley. And a lot of what Crowley got, he got from the Golden Dawn. So everything comes from somewhere. There's not much that's purely original under the sun. Um, so I think Wicca is the most marketed path um, when it comes to witchcraft, I think Wicca, there's so many books and like publications and it's a very approachable gateway path, if you will. But no, I don't think that Wicca is inseparable from it. Um, I do have an issue with practitioners who um, try to distance themselves from Wicca or even shit on Wicca, but yet still call the quarters like a Wiccan. Yes. I was like, going to say... Weird. Yeah, I was going to ask, do, don't you, or well, do you think that the majority of these neo-pagan uh, religious practices and beliefs that we have now, do you think that they are all kind of working off the template of Wicca, or do you think they are wholly original? I mean, I think some of them are, but I know that we've also had some, like, also true groups in our area um, that are like more found within heathenry and their blocks have nothing to do with the Sabbaths. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correct or not. I'm not a heathen, um, <laughs> contrary to popular belief. Um, but yeah, I'm not. Um, so I think that they're kind of doing like their own thing, like no. entirely. So I don't know. Yes and no. Okay. So do you think that witchcraft in itself is inherently pagan or can it be Christian, Buddhist, you know, whatever. I think that like folk practices can be a part of witchcraft. Mm -hmm. So now, like if your orthodoxy, if your mm -hmm. orthodoxy is like, let's say Islam, like your orthopraxy can look like that of a practicing Muslim with some folk magic from your ancestry or from your geographical location. Yes. Mm -hmm. Same way for us here in America, like where I live in Indiana, it's literally called the crossroads of America. Like that's how it's referred to. Um, so we have a lot of different influence from the West Coast, uh, the South. Appalachia is basically like our neighbor. Yeah. You know, we're not considered Appalachians, but 
like our southern part of our state is called the Little Smokies. Like we border it. Um, we have a lot of like East Coast influence too. Um, and so like a part of my practice is like honoring my ancestral like practices. But like also like I didn't grow up in Lebanon. You know what I mean? Like I grew up here on this dirt. So for me as a witch, I feel like it's important to also pay respect to the spirits of the land that I live on. Absolutely. So is witchcraft pagan? No, right? I, yeah, I would say no. Okay. So Wicca is a religion. We can agree on that, right? Yeah. And witchcraft is not a religion. Can we agree on that or no? I would say that witchcraft for some people is just a practice. Mm -hmm. um, and you can blend that folk practice of folk magic or so low magic. I'm going to stop with you right religion. there to ask you a question. Yeah. You have brought up the term folk magic several times so far. What is your definition of folk magic? I would define folk magic as like low magic, earth magic. So like anything that is of like the earth. Um, okay. A really quick example that comes to my head is like this idea or superstition of like a lucky rabbit's foot. Okay. Like keeping that with you to bring you good luck or keeping chicken's feet in your car to keep you from being pulled over. Mm -hmm. You know, like that to me is like folk magic. High magic, ceremonial magic to me is more ritualistic. Um, and it typically mm -hmm. involves like the above. So the celestial, the divine, um, high magic typically is influenced by religion versus I feel like low magic can coincide with religion, but low magic doesn't necessarily need to be religious. Okay. I, so... I would love for someone to show me some ceremonial magic that isn't religious. Mm -hmm. um, I think that like the satanic temple with like their uh, devil's tome book, like they have some ceremonial rituals and they say they're not religious or involving the divine, but like I've read the book, the devil's tome by Shiva honey. And it feels to me like that's still kind of like bordering on invoking the divine through apotheosis within which the high self Crowley would call this the HGA, the Holy guardian angel is still divine. Like our higher selves are part of God because we are living right. God. So, you know, so when you add religious aspects to witchcraft, when you add the divine in any way to a witch practice, does that not make it Wicca? And if not, how is that not Wicca? Because Wicca has always been explained to most of us as the religion of the witch. So how is it different if you add divinity to witchcraft? How does that not equate to Wicca? Well, I mean, there's really two main sort of like sects here. There's mm -hmm. like your ATW, like your American traditional witchcraft. And there's mm -hmm. your BTW, like your British traditional witchcraft. And I think that if you look at the divine, like the Wiccan gods very much are two halves of a whole. Like they have to exist together. Mm -hmm. um, the god cannot exist without the goddess birthing him and bringing him into being and raising him, mating with him and rebirthing him. Um, in American traditional witchcraft, if you look at like the witch mother or the witch father, like these are two totally separate entities that don't necessarily need each other to, to, to be. Like right. the witch mother, the dark mother is its own vibration that does not need the witch father or the witch's devil to be a thing. Um, so I think it's, it, it's very easy to involve the divine and ceremonial magic and have it not be Wicca. Okay. I don't think that Wicca created that. Fair enough. So speaking of religion and the divine and God, staying on that mindset, Abrahamic faiths are everywhere in the world, right? I mean, they, mm -hmm. they dominate everything. Everything. Their tentacles are everywhere. So do with that said, do you think that Abrahamic faiths are inseparable from witchcraft at large? 
or do you think there will always be some influence of an Abrahamic practice in witchcraft? Um, I don't think that Abrahamic practice is like an inherent part of the craft. I think that mm -hmm. it's part of mine. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's inseparable in a way from mine and from like our coven's practice. Right. Um, there are plenty of like pagan paths that are totally valid that have nothing to do with anything Abrahamic. Like, like we mentioned earlier, there's heathen groups out there that celebrate their blocks that have nothing to do with anything Abrahamic. Right. If that's your path, that's your truth, that's your you. business. Yeah. Yeah. So what, if any, but I think you did just say that it does play a part in your practice. So mm -hmm. what, what Abrahamic faiths, specifically if you can name them play a part in your witchcraft and why so for one on a cultural level like looking at islam like there are parts of islam that like i still incorporate in like more of my folk practice um so looking at like ramadan for example i'm not necessarily fasting for allah for god um, but it's something that I try to do more on a cultural level to connect with my ancestors and connect right. with my family. Um, right. Because it's more of like, how many of you grew up Christian but still celebrate Christmas but do it in a secular way? That's what Ramadan, that's what Eid looks like to me personally. Um, speaking more from a coven witch's perspective or more from like an ATW perspective, um, the witch is devil. We can talk about the devil for a minute. Um, have you heard about our infernal Lord, JK? But the witch's devil is an algramation and um, a conglomeration of multiple deities. So the witch's devil is not just one god. The witch's devil is like a current that multiple different deities pour into. So the witch's devil could be Pan. The witch's devil could be Serunos. The witch's devil could be Apollo. The witch's devil could be the pre-Abrahamic Roman Lucifer, as found within the Gospel of Aradia. Um, but it's also a reclamation of these gods through a satanic, Luciferian, Abrahamic lens. So I know that Margaret Murray, a lot of people feel, has been widely disproven, or a lot of her research was kind of not really founded, but her whole kind of thesis was during the witch trials these witches were confessing under torture to working with the devil. Right. And part of the thesis is that any pagan God would just be labeled a devil or the devil. Like, so the witch's devil has also kind of taken on some of the persecution of the witch trials um, along with pagan deities. So like to me, working with Lucifer can be, in an Abrahamic sense of working with the Abrahamic devil or an Islamic sense of working with shaitan or in a pagan sense, like working with pan or the green man. And so the witch's devil is a combination or a trinity of all of those factors. And that's more from like an SCC perspective. That's more from a ATW, American traditional witchcraft sort of perspective. Um, so yeah, it's, I would say it's, inseparable from that because that's a part of our history mm -hmm. that doesn't just go away like right so uh, you brought up the witch's devil and just the devil at large and that leads me to a question that i had that i really wanted your uh, response to and that is why is satanism be it the cultural politi political social version or the like Judaic version, why is Satanism and demonology becoming so popular in the witchcraft scene? Because it is exploding. Um, I don't know. Like, I think that a lot of what we perceive as exploding is based on our personal like algorithms and for you pages. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen some demonolatry and like working with infernals kind of trending more so. Satanism is a pretty atheistic religion. They call it, they call themselves like a religion, if you want to call it that. But it's more so a political movement. A lot of people confuse Luciferianism and Satanism, kind of like they confuse like Iceland and Greenland. Like Luciferianism <laughs> is more of like the religious belief and practice 
while Satanism is more like a lifestyle and a political alignment. Mm -hmm. um, I have some good friends who are Satanists. I've had some on my channel, um, some bishops and some clergymen from the Satanic Temple. Um, so I don't know if that's necessarily trending. Um, I think that the temple has alleged to do some very good activism work, which I think is... Uh, I like a lot of their political ideas, like their after-school Satan club, um, keeping God out of public schools. I think mm -hmm. that's important. I like their, um, you know, the whole Roe v. Wade and like what they're attempting to do there. Um, I think that a lot of that is very limited on a legal level, but they're doing their best, I think. I know that the TST also has like some controversial history with Lucian and an I'm not a temple Satanist, so I'm not necessarily in agreement or alignment with some of that. Um, the Luciferian demonolater thing, I think, why is that popular? I don't know if I would say that is popular. I think that that's just becoming a more and more accessible path because, I mean, there's data out there that at least for us Americans as a society, we're becoming more and more secular. So I think the taboo around things like that is becoming less so. And so people feel more at liberty to explore those things without fear of like losing their jobs or families. Yes. Um, yeah. So just to dive a little deeper into like the theology and philosophy of Luciferianism and demonology and just the presence of what we would call demonic entities in a witchcraft practice, <clears throat> Do you subscribe to the belief that demons, quotes, demons, are inherently negative entities? I won't use the word evil, but negative. And if they, if you do view them as inherently negative, why would one want to even work with them? I don't view them as inherently negative. Um, if we, okay, so if we look at like the Legamenton or the 72, if we're looking at like more of a Solomonic perspective, because there's really like three main grimoire like traditions. There's like the grimoire mm -hmm. varium. There's like the lesser and greater keys of Solomon. There's like the pseudomonicum demonica or whatever. Like there's different interpretations of demonic along with like your Abrahamic interpretation, which mm -hmm. is pretty flat and boring. Um, <laughs> my personal belief is that a lot of these so-called demons of like the 72 keys of Solomon are some of them, I believe, are Sumerian and Mesopotamian gods that have been demonized um, the same way that oftentimes Hecate has um, and have basically been made to be the bad guys of the Abrahamic religion. Um, you know, Judaism, Christianity, Islam coming from the Middle East, they were gods in those lands prior to right. uh, Yahweh. And Yahweh, in my opinion, if we look at like the Old Testament and the Torah, Yahweh is actually much more in line with who the Christians call Satan and the devil. Yahweh is asking for human sacrifice. Yahweh is asking for you to kill your son and your brother. Um, Lucifer never said that. Right. Um, so when it comes to these demons like Astaroth, for example, Astaroth is Astarte, who is Ishtar, the Mesopotamian queen of heaven. I don't think that she's necessarily evil or negative. She appears as more male in the um, ligamenton, like in, um, as Astaroth, she has a more masculine appearance, but she's linked to Ishtar, Astarte, the queen of heaven. I don't necessarily think that she's evil. Um, I do know that, where is the book? Hold on. I'm going to do a little shameless plug here. Um, this Go is not it. my book. This is Lorelai Black's book, who teaches the RTA, the Red Thread Academy. Um, this is The Witch's Key to the Legion, A Guide to Solomonic Sorcery. It's the revised and expanded version. It looks like this. Um, I believe this is available on her Etsy, um, as well as Amazon. But basically, this book teaches people how to work with the 72 more so from like a witch's perspective, as opposed to like a magician. Because, like, a lot of the Solomonic magic involves basically enslaving demons using angels. And it's very high magic. Um, and this is more of, like, a folkish way to work with the 72 
um, these particular demons from more so the perspective of a witch because witches have always been linked to the taboo, the perverse, and the infernal in a lot of folklore and history. And so as witches, we can have a cooperative relationship with demons um, if we so choose to. And we don't necessarily need to invoke sacred circles and trap them in triangles and use holy names to protect ourselves because like we're already of that frequency. Mm. That's our belief. I'm not wow. saying that has to be anyone else's. Yeah. Um, and so that's a really good book that I would recommend for people who are interested in working with demons. Um, and there's also like a demonic do not call list of maybe some demons that aren't necessarily the best to work with. I think that the demons, um, the jinn, the fae are neutral and that there are groups of them that are malevolent. Sure. I think there's malevolent gods as well. They're Aphrodite <laughs> being one of them. Yeah. Aphrodite being one of them. People think of Aphrodite, they think of, you know, love and beauty. Um, she's very jealous and vindictive. Almost every single Greek war was either started by or involved with Aphrodite. There's no separating her from her fuckboy Aries. There's there's no separation there. Love and war, that's poetry. Um, and people think of Aphrodite and think of her to be a very love and light or soft goddess. I think that she is possibly even one of the most cruel of the Greek gods um, in her mythology and in her stories. So yeah, I think that some of the 72 demons or demons in general can be land spirits of the Middle East. And I think some are deities. I, I feel like I've been rambling. I'm sorry. No, no, you're still on point. It's great. Yeah. All right, all right. Did you have more to add? Was that it? That was it. I'll shut up. No, you were doing great. Um, okay, so changing topics. Um, right. To something sort of more lighthearted, but also not really. And that is, uh, why do you think so many witches? And I, I mean... I say so many, and I realize that witchcraft is a global phenomenon. Mm -hmm. But at least here in America, and I would say also in Western Europe, it seems like so many witches are queer. Be that, you know, anything in the LGBTIQA. Why do you think so many queer people, especially now with millennials and Gen Z specifically, why do you think so many are drawn to witchcraft? Do you think there's a I love this question, first of all. Love this question. Um, so let's look at like history, right? Um, mm -hmm. How many queer people throughout history, even still today um, in India, like the Hidras, how many queer people have served the orthodoxy of their geographical landscape yeah like that's a t how come so many queer people are into paranormal investigation how come so many queer people are into witchcraft how come so many queer people are into the liminal it's because i believe that we as lgbtq xyz mafia gang are inherently liminal people um like Myself, as like a pansexual trans woman, I feel like I walk a lot of liminality every single day simply by existing. Right. Um, and I think the same can be said also for like our other beloved letters of the alphabet mafia. We are inherently liminal, um, which is inherently a divine thing. And in the past, in different societies, we have had the privilege of being able to kind of devote our life to the path of the Magi or the witch or the priestess um, in ways that maybe some of our heterosexual or cis brothers and sisters maybe couldn't because they were busy raising children and we could be at the temple studying the books um, because we weren't breeding in the same way. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, all over the world, like everywhere, in every primitive, I don't like using that word, 
but in every primitive culture, we see queer people constantly being the religious leader of that community. So there is something to us. There's something to us that's inherently magical, I think. It just is. Well, yeah, I think there's magic even amongst cis people and heteronormative people, there's magic. Um, but I think queer people find a need to validate the fact that we are sacred and magical because we live in a world right now that is so shaped by the Abrahamic religion and is taught that we are not yeah. divine. That um, especially with a lot of the Christian Abrahamic trauma, like you're going to hell is the narrative. Like you're scum of the earth is the narrative that a lot of queer people have felt from those religions. Um, Christianity explicitly, I would say. Um, and I think that's why a lot of queer people need to find the validation in their queerness in connection with the sacred but like the divine is queer. Like the divine is all things. Like God, the universe, whatever you want to call it, is in all things. From like an animist perspective, it's literally a rock. It's a tree. It's you and it's me, girl. Like it's in everything. It's so, every woman. <laughs> so do you think that in joining the whole like the greater witchcraft community do you think in doing that and also just in using the word witch itself is an act of reclamation of identity for queer people i think it can be i think it can be sure okay cool so talking about our cisgendered brothers and sisters uh you know i think that while witchcraft in a modern since now is very open to all kinds of people. I think that there is a general consensus back through history that witchcraft is inherently feminine. It is inherently female. It is a woman's practice. It is the mysteries of women. Do you agree with that? No. So, okay. So, even though you don't agree with that, there, you know, a lot of people do think that still, but as I said, back through history. And- But I don't think even back through history, that's totally accurate. Um, if you look at a lot of our Western esoteric founding fathers, um, look at Gerald Gardner, look at Aleister Crowley, look at Anton LaVey, yeah. look at Israel Rigardi, look at David Chumbly. How many of our authors and influential people are actually men. Um, so I think it's more of an issue that there's two sides to it. There's your womb man sides, these cis women who think that because they have ovaries and a womb and they birth children that they have the true claim to magic, um, which I think magic is in all of us because the divine is in all of us. Um, so I think that they have that is magical. I'm not taking away from that. That is a beautiful thing that people who are birthing people birth people into the world. Like that's beautiful. That's wonderful. Menstruation is a sacred thing. They're not the only ones with magic though. Um, and in the same respect, like most of our influential founders of Western esotericism are actually men. Um, most of our authors are actually men. Um, because Wicca pulled from Thelema, which pulled from Golden Dawn. Right. Some of those orders are male exclusive orders. So I think the notion that like it's a girls club comes really from male privilege, in my opinion, because they come into these spaces with their male privilege, not realizing that they do indeed have it because male privilege is a thing. Um, if I were to, let's say, um, you know, I were to take my car in to get an oil change with my husband, for example, mm -hmm. it's my car, it's in my name, I'm the one driving the damn car. They're going to talk to him about what's going on with my car. Like, and so I think men sometimes come into the craft thinking that they're just talk over people or their voices are going to be heard more. Um, and in a lot of pagan and craft spaces, that's not the case. 
because respect is earned. It's not just given to you because you're a man. And so there's this notion that it's a girl's club um, when in fact, that's actually not historically, even in like the 19th century, like remotely the reality when so many authors are actually male. Mm. So would you agree with that? I agree with the 20th century and the late 19th century, yes. Um, absolutely. I agree with everything you just said. But uh, what what role, you, ta- you kind of already answered this question just then, but what role do you think that men have in witchcraft? Because, you know, not to stereotype, but, you know, I'm, I'm male, so I feel like I can say this. Um, men have egos, like really big egos, and that's a big part of their identity. And like you said, they expect to kind of be the top dog everywhere that they go. And when they enter into a space like witchcraft, like you said, respect has to be earned amongst your peers. So what, 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 um, what space do men really feel like F-I-L-L, Phil, in witchcraft. Does that make sense? What space do you think women fill in witchcraft? Right. That's a great answer. That's a great answer. You answered it. That's perfect. That's perfect. So winding down, because we are getting close to our hour mark. Here um, I am. I want to ask you about covens. You know, there is, for forever, there's going to be debate about the validity of a solitary witch versus a witch that's in a coven. Are covens important to witchcraft? I mean, I don't want to be a fence writer, but yes and no, you Mm -hmm. know, like yes and no. I think that, so... I'm a high priestess within the SCC, and we are a neo tradition. So what is SCC? The Solar Court Coven. Mm-hmm. Um, we're a neo tradition, and I think that because we are a neo tradition, we have a lot of um, other covens that try to like devalidate our tradition because we're neo, because we're a newer tradition. Um, mm-hmm. But a lot of those same people, their tradition came from our grandparents' era. Like, <laughs> you're looking at, like, the 60s, the 50s. Um, so I would take that with a lot of salt. Um, yeah. I think the fact that we even say that we're a neo-tradition versus some people who are like, oh, yeah, we're from the 1600s. But they can't even name their lineage back more than three generations is a little sus yeah. um, on an integrity level. <laughs> so, but I also get a lot of solitary witches who have this pushback of, you know, they're solitary. And it's like, that's wonderful that you're solitary. Like myself or any other witch in our tradition of the SCC have no issue with that. I think that there is a difference between like coven witches and solitary witches. And I can't really put that into words okay, because it's part of the ecstatic ecstasy of ritual that's an inner mystery that's i'm not keeping from anyone because of like a fourth power rule i'm saying like until you have experienced what um lineage and group magic looks like you just haven't experienced it so it's not like it's greater or less than if you're a solitary witch that's a wonderful thing and even within the scc like we're all also solitary practitioners as well like we all have our own practices as well um even like other magical orders they still have their own practice as well as being this so it's kind of like the conversation of being born and made a witch I believe that witches are born inherently witches. And I believe that witches are made through initiation. Um, And if that initiation comes from a group or if that comes from spirit or if that comes from, you know, the divine, that's between you and the divine. That has nothing to do with me. Um, Yeah. Okay. So kind of a fun question to, to start leading us out. Witch is a really fun word, I think. It's just fun. And it brings up so many images, you know, of things that we've been shown in media since childhood, right? 
be them scary or enticing or both. Right. But why the word witch for you specifically? I think that labels are really fun and exciting and are mutable to a degree. So why witch? Why not some other fun, magical title? Why witch? What other titles? Like, you know, you- um, sorceress or enchantress or, you know, things like that. Um, well, there's Magi, which I vibe with. Magi basically, you know, kind of predating witch. Um, but I personally choose witch because witch is an archetype and of its own. If we look at folk tales and literature, like the witch is often this kind of almost sometimes anti-hero. Um, I really vibe with that a lot. And witches are connected to the taboo and the perverse and sometimes the infernal. And I vibe with that a lot. Witches are often like the underdogs and I vibe with that a lot. Um, Which to me is power and it's grace and it's beauty. And those are three words that I think describe virtues of mine personally. Um, Yeah. I love that. I got chills. (laughs) I love that. Um, Last question. It's a little cliche, but I think it's an important question. And, you know, as someone who has been on the witch path for a while, what advice do you have for specifically young people, like teenagers, college-age kids, What advice do you have for them if they are wanting to kind of dip their toes into witchcraft, but they really just do not know where to start? Because it can seem overwhelming. I would say slow down. Like if I could go back and talk to, you know, my 18-year-old, 17-year-old self who like started kind of having this apotheosis in spirituality and exploring alternative religion slow down. Like you don't have to understand everything immediately. Um, There's a reason why they call some of this arcane mysteries, mysteries. Um, The path to me of the witch is a crooked spiral. So don't hesitate from, you know, revisiting things that you thought you've already learned, because I assure you, you can pick up that beginner's book. And even as a seasoned witch, you can still learn something new, even from a beginner's book. Um, I would say read and research and also listen to your own spirits, because I believe the spirits speak to those who listen. Um, And you will be guided um, by spirit to your path to understanding your own perception of the divine. Um, And I think it's good to also take other witches words in and like listen to them um but don't let anything necessarily be your gospel like do your own research do your own fact checking and also put the fucking books down and actually do the work um yeah i think the first pillar the first power of the sphinx the first pillar of the magi to know is where so many witches get stuck is they know they're a witch And they know they've read these books, but they forget to also will and dare. Like, no, actually go out to the cemetery. No, actually go to the woods by yourself. Go out there and do the work. Do those invocations. I understand we got work, we got school, we got families, but we all have the same 24 hours in a day. So if the path of the craft is important to you, you will make it a priority. Yes, absolutely. Blessed be. Yes. Blessed be in this be. That is perfect advice. Perfect advice. And if you're watching this or listening, because I know a lot of people just listen to the videos too, like a podcast, replay that part. Because she really, really gave you the answers there. Um, Play it over and over. And really listen to what she said. Because she was spitting truth. Um, so Jasmine, thank you so, so much for coming to Mystic Meetings. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes. And lastly, 
just tell people where they can find you if they are intrigued by this interview. If, if, they're, if they're completely brand new to you, where can they find you? Well, you can find me on um, Facebook and Instagram under Jasmine Ambrosia. Instagram is best if you want to communicate with me directly. Um, you can also find the SCC tradition at www.sillercourt.com. <laughs> if you're interested in our personal sort of background and gnosis when it comes to the craft, um, you can also find my Patreon under Jasmine Ambrosia, Third Eye Fortunes, um, where I teach occult classes and divination classes and host workshops. You can also find me at Spiritual Gardens on the south side of Indianapolis, where I read and teach in person if you're local. Um, you can also find me as Three Obsidian Eyes on TikTok if you're interested in my shit posts or thirst traps. Um, yeah, I'll send I'll send you all of my links. And yeah, you can just... all the links will be down below. So go check them out and watch her content specifically on YouTube because it's amazing. She knows a lot of things and she says a lot of things and she does a lot of things and they're all amazing. So. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jasmine. Bye, everybody. Girl, that was good.